Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be able to uh, speak with you, although remotely. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to share God's word with you today. And uh, before we turn to scripture, just to very briefly share with you concerns uh, coming out of the work of the Christian Institute. <clears throat> Can I say that uh, lockdown may have uh, affected many businesses and many organizations, but it hasn't diminished the work of the Christian Institute in any way at all. In fact, these past months have been exceptionally busy with different issues in different uh, parts of the UK. Here in Wales, there's a particular concern regarding the new subject of religion, values and ethics, which is going to be replacing RE in our schools. And I'd ask you to pray that that would, uh, that the curriculum would not marginalise uh, the teaching of Christianity, but that in in fact, it would lead to a refocusing of uh, lessons onto the teaching of Christian values and ethics. Thank you for all of your prayers. Thank you for your continued support of the Christian Institute. If you are not yet on our list, uh, please go to the website christian.org.uk and uh, if you click on the donate button don't worry that doesn't mean you will have to give money but if you click on that button you will also see that there's a, uh, a sign up form and you'll be able to fill in your details and send that off and you will be added to our mailing list. Well, let's turn to scripture. And this morning I want us to look at Esther chapter one. <coughs> Famously, Esther is one of two books in the Old Testament that does not mention the name of God. The other is the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, as it's also known. But you would be wrong to think that that means that this book of Esther is only dealing with an historic account, that it has nothing to teach us about God. Indeed, the absence of the name of God fits the purpose of the book very well. What the book of Esther is pointing out to us is that the unseen God controls the movements of individuals and empires. That God, even when he is not recognized, even when he is not acknowledged, even when people see no evidence of his sovereign control, yet he still rules over the affairs of men. Hebrew scholars have found the name of God, Yahweh, repeated four times in the text of Esther in acrostic form. They suggest it may be a sort of secret code to show that God is the one who is behind all that is happening. The message of the book of Esther is simply this, that when God seems most absent in human affairs, he is most present and at work. I've noticed recently a few adverts on the television uh, using government announcements regarding COVID-19 and saying that the use of um, medication is advised 
And then you just spot uh, the name of a particular brand. And the advert is not pushing that brand, but it's there. It's a sort of subliminal appeal. Yes, any form of paracetamol would be helpful if you have COVID-19. But this particular brand, well, its logo is there. It's a sort of hidden message. Well, God is there and he's in control. And we live at a time when in our land, perhaps, God seems to be absent with the church rapidly contracting, with God's laws being ignored, with godly influences dictating the course of the nation. And this can cause us to despair. It can even perhaps cause us to cry out to God as to where he is. Why has he abandoned us? Well, we should be encouraged to remember that in unseen ways, God is at work. He is still controlling the affairs of this nation and the events of our lives. And he's doing so for his ultimate glory and our good. We should not think God is absent, that he has forgotten us. Well then, in this first chapter of Esther, we are introduced to a powerful king. His name is Xerxes, Xerxes the first son of Darius I, and Xerxes ruled over the Persian Empire from 486 to 465 BC. He is presented to us as the master of all the then known civilized world. His kingdom stretches from India to modern day Ethiopia. We're told it's organized into 127 provinces. Now we're also told in verse three, that in the third year of his reign, having just successfully put down a rebellion in Egypt, he is turning his attention to dealing with Greece. We know from history he is raising the largest naval and land force the world had ever seen. The Greek historian Herodotus tells us that this vast military uh, gathering involved 2.6 million men. In keeping with Persian tradition, Xerxes mixes business with pleasure. And as he's making his plans to deal with Greece, he does so by inviting all of the nobles and officials the military leaders, the heads of the provinces to attend at his capital, Susa. And whilst they're there making their plans, he throws a sort of six month party. At the end of the period, there's a seven day feast. All the eminent guests are invited, we see in verse 5. Verse 6 tells us the opulent luxury of his palace 
tastefully decorated for the occasion, was a fitting backdrop to a display of royal liberality. As Xerxes provides abundantly for his guests, verse 7, he's very magnanimous. He decrees that rather, having, rather than having to follow his lead, as was the tradition, his guests could drink as much or as little as they pleased according to their own customs, verse 8. So we have this picture of a man who sits upon the throne of a great empire with total dominion over many nations, with absolute authority. He gives great banquets which display his vast wealth and shows considerable bounty. The magnificent, beneficent ruler of the world. However, we know that all this went to his head and he was arrogant. An inscription on the foundation stone of one of his royal palaces read, I am Xerxes, the great king, the only king, the king of all countries which speak all kinds of languages, the king of this entire big and far-reaching earth. What Xerxes fails to see is that there is an even greater king, one who will dictate the course of his life, one who will use him for his own unseen purposes, the Almighty God. Rulers and leaders of nations feel themselves important. They have all of their trappings of power, patronage and authority. Whether they are despotic or benign, we must remember that they are all servants of the will of God. God raises up individuals and nations to fulfill his purpose. It is he who rules over the affairs of men. He brings great figures to power and he brings them to naught. He raises up a Nebuchadnezzar and brings him down. He raises up a Herod and brings him to naught. God rules. And as Christians, we do not begrudge leaders and rulers their authority. We believe that governments are God's gift to humanity, ordained by him. We believe that whoever resists the authorities opposes what God has appointed and they bring judgment upon themselves as we read in Romans 13 verses 1 to 2. But we also expect those in authority to exercise their power in the knowledge that they are answerable to God for all they do. And therefore we pray for those in authority, we pray for government and opposition parties, we pray for all those who have such positions of power, as we are told in 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 7, we intercede before God for them. And we plead that God in his mercy 
will use them for his purposes and will direct them so that they pass laws that are in keeping with God's own will and purpose. But as we pray for those in authority, we rejoice that we are subjects of the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has dominion over all, both the living and the dead. And all power belongs to him. And ultimately, every knee will bow to him. He has final authority in all things as given to him by his heavenly Father. And he always uses that authority for the good of his people. He possesses immeasurable wealth and with an imaginable generosity he bestows boundless grace upon those who love him. He provides a regular banquet known as the Lord's Supper. No banquet on earth can compare with it. It is a love feast for pardoned sinners. The bread and wine are the symbols of his broken body and his outpoured blood, all for the sake of our salvation. And this <clears throat> banquet is a foretaste of a far greater one to come, known as the marriage feast of the Lamb. What a king Jesus Christ is, and what a blessing it is for us to be his subjects. Well, in looking again at Xerxes, we see a drunken king. Despite his greatness and high opinion of himself, Xerxes was as frail as all men and subject to the same excesses and misjudgments. On the last day of the feast, we are told that he is in high spirits because of wine. The wine has literally gone to his head, impairing his judgment. And in this condition, he decides to call Vashti the queen, to appear before him and the assembled dignitaries, most of whom no doubt were as drunk as he was. He wants them to be impressed by the queen's beauty. It was not enough that his guests should be impressed by the splendour of his palace or the generosity of his hospitality, they must also admire the beauty of his wife. Now this request was degrading to Vashti and an affront to the norms of the day. Wives were prohibited from being present at such banquets and that's underlined in verse 9 by the fact that Vashti was holding a separate banquet for women. Vashti was right to be affronted by this uh, act, by being called upon to parade herself before the men. She may not have been wise in refusing the king's command, but no doubt she was right to feel offended by it. It was uh, said that Joseph Stalin seldomly 
drank himself, but he plied his guests liberally with alcohol. He did so in order to loosen their tongues, to discover their weaknesses, which he could later exploit. He didn't partake himself, but he knew that he could use alcohol to his advantage by getting others drunk. Well, Xerxes, he doesn't just get others drunk, but he is drunk himself. As all men, Xerxes is sinful. He is subject to weakness and frailty. He may be the great king of the world empire, but he is a sinner. Rich and poor, famous and the unknown, rulers and those ruled are all subject to the same temptation and sinful tendencies. And therefore, all are equally under God's judgment, and all are in need of the salvation that Jesus Christ alone can bring. There is no place of greater equality than when men stand before the Lord of God and bow down at the foot of the cross. And there is no individual this morning who can say that they do not need to repent and be saved. The Bible as a whole, especially perhaps the New Testament, warns of the dangers of alcohol. In contrast to being filled with wine, the Christian is encouraged to be filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 5 verse 18. Now amongst believers there would be a difference of opinion as to whether it is right to uh, drink alcohol at all or whether we should be teetotalers. But that is not the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is really this that those who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour also own him to be their king. As their saviour, he delivers them from sins that would spoil and mar their lives. As king, he rules in their hearts. They are his subjects who want his control over their lives. And we are duty bound not to hand over the direction of our lives, not to give control of our lives to anyone or anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So being drunk being in a state of a drug-induced stupor. Well, those things are clearly sinful because instead of us being under Christ's kingship, we have subjected ourselves to the control of something else which will only seek to dehumanize us by separating us from God's will. A drunken king. Finally, we see Xerxes as a furious king. Vashti's refusal to attend the banquet sends him into a furious rage. It doesn't cause him to reflect upon his own error of judgment. All he can see is the insubordination of his wife. He's no longer proud of her. The one he wanted 
to parade so that others would be in awe of her beauty. He now views as being a disobedient and ungrateful wretch. He is irritated at her refusal. And in his anger, he calls together his seven closest advisors to discuss what punishment he should meet out to his wife. His advisors are not concerned to see justice done, but to ensure that Vashti is made an example of. After all, if the other women follow her example, then these men as husbands perhaps will lose control over their wives. In the end, the council advised Xerxes to dispose of Vashti and to find another queen. Xerxes readily agrees to this and an edict is sent to every part of the empire declaring that every man was to be ruler in his own household. Xerxes would have been better off admitting his own fault in the affair, apologising to Vashti. But in his fury, he takes revenge. Now we know because we are aware of the rest of the story that behind this God is at work. The removal of Vashti prepares the way for the rest of the book and the introduction of Esther, who will become Xerxes' new wife. She will be placed at the very heart of the Persian Empire. And when the enemies of God's people seek to destroy the Jews, it will be Esther who will be in the right place at the right time to intervene so that the Jews are spared, so that the line of the Messiah is preserved, so that the incarnation of the Son of God in Bethlehem takes place, so that a Saviour would die upon a cross and bring forgiveness of sin to people of all nations. Behind this bull-headed, drunken man, as he acts so unwisely and perhaps so unjustly, is nevertheless God's sovereign will and purpose bringing about the continuation of his plan to bring the Messiah to this world. Well, as we look at Xerxes, we have to acknowledge it's always easy for us to be angry with someone else, to lay the blame at someone else's uh, doorstep, rather than for us to see our own faults. It's one of the characteristics of sinful pride that we see the speck of dust in someone else's eye and not perceive the plank in our own. And so we need to ask the Lord to give us grace that we might see our faults first before those of any others. And we can be thankful that our King the Lord Jesus Christ does not lose his temper with us, despite the fact that we often provoke him. 
our disobedience must surely test his patience. Our refusal to act upon his righteous commands. But praise God that our Saviour does bear patiently with us. And he will never depose us from our position of being joint heirs with him in the kingdom of God. We may deserve to lose our salvation, but we never will, because he is faithful. Oh, what a joy it is, what an encouragement it is to reflect again today that even when we are unfaithful, he always remains faithful to us. Not that that excuses our unfaithfulness, not that that should cause us to regard it as being of no great importance, quite the opposite. As we see his loving faithfulness to us, that should convict us all the more of our lack of faithfulness to him and encourage us to obey him in all things. And as we think of Xerxes and his counsellors who uh, encourage him in a wrong action, we again rejoice that our Saviour has given us the wisest counsellor of all, the Holy Spirit. The one who leads us in all truth, as we're told in John's Gospel. The one who opens our understanding to God's word. The one who doesn't flatter us by telling us what we want to hear, but will always do us good by telling us what we need to hear, the truth. We can depend upon him and we must daily seek that the unseen hand of our Heavenly Father will direct us by the guidance of the Holy Spirit through the infallible Word of God. So here we are. Uh, we've looked briefly at this opening chapter of the book of Esther. We've reminded ourselves that the message of the book is that the unseen God rules in all things and as we look out upon our world and upon our nation in these days of uh, chaos in these days of lockdown and in these days of fear and apprehension we have been reminded that the sovereign lord of heaven and earth still reigns he still rules over men. He raises up prime ministers and presidents and kings and empires. And he brings them down. He takes a man like Xerxes, so full of pride, so confident in his own power. And he uses Xerxes. He is a man who is fallen and flawed in his drunken state. He makes a terrible decision. And yet in it all, as Xerxes must bear the blame, God is yet working out his purpose for his glory's sake and the good of his people. We see that in contrast to Xerxes and all other human authorities, 
our king is righteous and just he is faithful and the banquet that he invites us to is the banquet of remembrance of his body broken for us his blood shed us his blood spilt for the forgiveness of our sin and oh we are thankful for our saviour and we delight to be under his rule and as we obey him we pray for those in authority over us we ask that god would give them wisdom and we look to the great wisdom of god the holy spirit leading and guiding us through the infallible word that the spirit himself has inherent inherently inspired who is in control god is in control to who should we give glory honor and praise to the lord god almighty amen